So I'll read this one. From Psalm 115, verse 1, it says this, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory, because of your love and faithfulness. And I'm going to, I want to say that a phrase at a time, and you, and you repeat it with me, okay? Uh, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name, be the glory, because of your love and faithfulness. Amen. As we as we worship today, we're going to talk about things from from the, our past and the present of our church. But remember, remember, we're not here to glorify people, but what the Lord has done through our church and what and who the Lord is. Stand with us as we sing to God be the glory. to just pray but it's a lawyer and a mic so I did just want to share with y'all quickly I said that God impressed me this morning was in the Old Testament whenever the Israelites would go through something mighty that God had done for them they'd build a stack of stones and make a pillar as a memorial to what God has done not just to have that one moment so that future generations would remember what God has done for them and I, I look at our old building that's now revitalized and repurposed for another hundred years of ministry and it's such the, the amount of weddings and marriages and salvations and baptisms and things that have occurred, just praise God, this is a memorial for our community to look back and say, hey, here's what God has done over the years. It's not about any of us, but just what God's doing here. So with that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you so much for today. We thank you for what you've done over the last 165 years in this church body, and we look forward to what uh, you have for us in the future, Father. We ask that you're Holy Spirit, just be with us today. Just move throughout the service, through uh, the worship, through uh, the speaking of your word, and just in all things, let us give you glory, Father. And Lord, as we go out of this day, help us to always be able to turn back and point to memorial. Remember to tell the next generation and the future generations of what you have done and who you are, Father. Amen. We love you and we thank you for this day. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. 
Well, good morning. My name is Alvino Valdez. I'm the associate pastor here. My wife is supposed to be here with me, but I don't know where she ended up at, so God bless her. There she, there she comes. At any rate, we just want to welcome you this morning. We're so glad to have you here for our 165th anniversary of this church. Uh, we're so thankful for this day. I want to recognize this morning Bob Stuckey and also Sherry uh, and John Hugendorn. Bob was an architect for the building remodel and uh, John and Sherry helped us out with actually uh, doing the work. And we, we're thankful for them. They've done a great, great job. And we're thankful for all of you being here this morning. Uh, I know there's been a lot of changes in the last 165 years, just being here in this building uh, itself and the remodel of the new church. There's a lot of new faces. Uh, I don't guess there's anybody that was here back in 165, I, and I'm not gonna say it. I know what you, I, I know what you're thinking. I'm not gonna mention Barbara Grimes at all. <laughs> But we're glad that you're here this morning. Now, this church has really, um, Sam misspoke a little bit last, last Sunday when he said that Lisa and I had gone forward together. Actually, that wasn't the case. Uh, she actually came forward back in the old uh, sanctuary on a, on a Wednesday night as well. But she came forward while I was at work, and I was actually upset with her. I said, how in the world did you go get saved without me? But she knew that uh, I wasn't ready, and I probably would have been a hindrance to her. But she went forward and probably took me another three or four months before I came. I was still hiding out in the garage for a few months. But, but coming here has been such a blessing to our lives, and we know that it's because of our Lord Jesus Christ and the transformation and having had an encounter with him and with his people that have shown nothing but kindness and, and courtesy and uh, the love of Christ. So we're thankful for this church. We're thankful for all of you. And may God bless you all in this service today. And may he be glorified. Amen. Amen.
like that applause is for the Lord. Will you please be seated? Sixty-five years ago, but thinking back to this number, I realized that even 70 years ago, I was present in this congregation in my mother's womb. My birthday is in about a month from now. And you know, even at that time, God had a plan for my life, and it included this church. When my parents moved here uh, the year before, they were new to the community, and mother's co-workers at the San Seven Memorial Hospital invited her and dad to come visit the church. They visited several churches, but guess where they ended up? Right here. And it was just so nice that they welcomed into the fellowship and they began to serve. They raised me here starting out. And uh, as I look out over the con congregation, I just see so many faces of you whose mothers, grandmothers, aunts and uncles had a part in my life working in this church. They were faithful to teach the Word of God. I had been taught that God's Word is truth at, at home. And they reiterated that here at church, just like we do for our children today in the, in the uh, Awana program. God's Word is truth. They held on to that. And even through difficult times, we would persevere. We might have, I had a pastor once that said, it's okay to disagree, just don't be disagreeable. And so that, that's a good plan to have. Also, the uh, growing up years for our five boys was wonderful here. Keith and I spent many um, vacation times going on ski trips. We went on mission trips with them to Zuni, New Mexico. We helped uh, with activities at the church, just like we do now. It's just so wonderful that it just keeps going. And I just see the kids growing up um, and serving God and learning learning what they should from the Bible. Amen. Oh, you done? I'm done. Okay. <laughs> well, I was going to let her do most of the talking because she usually does. <laughs> <laughs> but my membership, as she stated, uh, started here at the church in 1976 when we moved back uh, to San Saba. As a child, when I was growing up and as a young adult, I was uh, baptized and a member of the Pecan Grove Baptist Church out here, which is still in existence. So after we got married and left and came back, and we both planted our roots here in this church uh, in 1976, uh, we did get married in this church in the old sanctuary, which, which obviously- red carpet. Yeah, it had red carpet, uh, which obviously doesn't look like it did then. Uh, back in 1970. So we've been around for a little while uh, and involved with this church. But in the 45 years that I've been a member, I have seen uh, and experienced many changes in this church. But there's always been one constant that has not changed. And it does not change. Sorry. And that is the love that this church shows to the community to each other through the shed blood of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. And I believe that because of this, the Lord has richly blessed His church. And I believe that he's made us the lighthouse 
in this community for the ongoing of God's kingdom. Brother Sam asked me to give a blessing on thanks, and Keith got kind of emotional about his deal, and I've been worried about this all week. I wish Sam would have just told me this morning. But anyway, we have a wonderful crowd, and y'all join me in a prayer of thanks. Father God, we come before your throne, Lord, just grateful for this day, and uh, 165 years ago, Lord, you planted this church here for this special occasion. And Lord, we just uh, are blessed in so many ways by the activities of this church and the former staffs and pastors. And Lord, there's just no way. We're so grateful, God, though, that uh, you've blessed us with the staff that we have now and the minister and his family. And, and Lord, I'm not going to start making a list. I just, we're just blessed, Lord, with, with these people. We just ask, Lord, now that you would guide us and direct us, and, and Lord, that uh, as each one of us go through this day, that we can think of something special to thank you about, Lord. We just ask that you would guide and direct us again. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us as we declare his faithfulness throughout all generations?
Parker, and I am the children's minister here at San Sabas First Baptist Church. And my uh, mother's parents, Roy and Jesse Hendricks, were members of this congregation. And Roy and Jesse had two daughters, Janice and my mother, Linda. And my grandmother served as a teacher in what was known in uh, Southern Baptist life as Training Union. Some of you might remember uh, Training Union. Um, training Union was the Sunday evening discipleship program. And my grandmother taught the children. And the space where she taught was the basement over the way, uh, the basement of uh, the sanctuary that was built in 1931. And when my mother was a teenager, she and one of her good friends taught children's Sunday school right here at First Baptist. And then in 1963, my mother married Owen Parks. And their wedding ceremony took place in that sanctuary that was built um, in 1931 and their reception down in the basement. So I grew up um, with the example of seeing both my parents and uh, their parents serving in various roles in the church. And as a family, when I was young, we attended Sunday school and worship at the Methodist Church where my father and his family um, were members. And I have wonderful memories of uh, Christmas programs and revival uh, services and church meals. And I learned so much about God and the Bible from dedicated teachers, including my mother. And I like to say that I had a lot of head knowledge about God and the Bible, but it wasn't until after my husband Darren and I married and I had two sons of my own that I realized my need to trust Jesus as my personal Savior and to, that I needed to be born again. And it was then that my head knowledge changed to heart knowledge. And I began to truly serve the Lord. In the year 2000, my husband Darren and I followed the Lord's direction and we began attending services here at First Baptist. Our son John Darren was in seventh grade and our son Justin was in fourth grade. And in February of that year, in 2000, um, the boys and I, my sons and I, were baptized together in where the baptistry was um, in that sanctuary and where my parents married all those years ago. And I praise the Lord for his faithfulness, his grace and his mercy. Um, I see his worked in the lives of my grandparents and my parents and my sons and now my two daughters-in-law and my six grandchildren. And even though I could have never imagined this path that the Lord would take us on, I am so humbled to say that he has given me the privilege to serve as the children's minister here since 2013 and to teach in the same sanctuary where my mother's family worshiped and my parents were married. And the Lord now has called my son, John Darren, to serve as youth minister here um, and to lead and teach along with his wife, Michelle, in the basement space that's been remodeled uh, for the youth ministry where so many years ago my grandmother taught training union. Um, and my son Justin and his wife Hannah have been called by the Lord to serve as international missionaries. So Keith encouraged me because I thought I'm gonna break down and cry. But you know, so I, I, pray, I told my husband, pray that I don't just have a total breakdown and cry. So. Uh, Isaiah 55 9 reads for as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts the Lord's thoughts and plans are perfect and his timing is precise I praise him for the legacy of faith passed down from my parents and grandparents and I am thankful for the paths on which he is leading my sons and their families and I encourage you as adults here today to stay faithful to teaching as Debbie said that the word of God is truth to keep teaching your children the children of our church family and future generations that will become connected with San Sabas First Baptist Church we have no idea the power of prayers 
um, for our kids and grandkids. Um, and I praise the Lord for uh, the beautiful remodel. I hope you've had an opportunity to go upstairs over there. It is incredible. Um, for his provision of the remodel of the whole educational floor and that uh, 1931 sanctuary. It is just amazing. It is an amazing space uh, to be used for ministry and most importantly dedicated to the glory of the Lord and the furthering of his kingdom. Yes. So I want to invite... Um, we have a number of kids that are here this morning that are part of our ministry on Sundays and or Wednesdays. And I want to invite all of them. They're going to sing a memory verse song for us right now. We're so excited. So if you kids will start making their way, there's a few leaders that are going to come up and help get uh, them uh, situated up here. So we want the third through sixth graders to line up up here across. And then you younger ones know where y'all are supposed to get down here. Awesome. So you older kids, come on across, back around. Awesome. Perfect. Okay, then some get on this side as well. Let's get the younger Oh, wow, look at all these kids. Isn't this awesome? Oh. Okay, so let's get some of y'all over here. Yeah. What's your hand right over here? Y'all stay on that side, okay? So we got people on that side. Awesome. Okay. We got a few coming down. Thank you for bringing your kids down. Thank you, parents, for getting your kids here. What an amazing turnout. We're so excited. Okay, we got a few more coming. Awesome. Come on down, guys. Okay, I think we're almost ready. We got everybody almost in position. Right. Haven't I commanded you? Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Be frightened, do not be dismayed, be strong and courageous.
lobby, and this is Macklin Haynes. We are members here. Dropping trash all over the place. Macklin's going to go first. Tell him what you're reading. Reading Ephesians 3, 20, 21. Now all glory to God, who is able through the mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Okay. Now let us pray. Father God, creator of everything in heaven and on earth, I pray that from your glorious unlimited resources, you would empower and strengthen us with the Holy Spirit. Lord, as we trust in you, make your home in our hearts. Grow our roots into your love and keep us strong. May we understand how wide, how long, how high, and how deep your love is. May we see the necessity of passing this understanding from generation to generation. Father, for this purpose, we dedicate ourselves and the new children's building to you and ask that you continue to use St. Sabbath's First Baptist Church as you have for so many years. With all praise and glory to you, in the name that is above all names, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We're just standing as we sing.
Amen. Well, if you're glad to be here this morning, say amen. amen. It's been wonderful hearing the testimonies of faith. I've so enjoyed it. Just been inspired and encouraged. And seeing the children sing the songs of faith, praise God for another generation. We want to be faithful to the next generation to pass along the wonderful works of God. Now listen, uh, I had a, a mother already come up to me and say, I want to apologize in, um, um, in before you preach. I want to apologize in advance for my child. That's what they said. So this is what I want to say to you that have children with you today. We are so glad your kids are in worship. We're so glad they're here. See, I think churches have two options. You can have a really quiet sanctuary or you can have kids, right? And we're grateful that the next generation is hearing the works of God and singing the praises of God and being a part of the prayer time and just participating in service. In fact, beginning on the first Sunday of December, we're going to have family worship every first Sunday of the month. We'll have some packets for the kids. We'll have some things to engage them. But we want for our children to be uh, exposed to the worship time, to sit with their parents, to hear their parents sing songs of worship, to hear their parents pray. And so we're so grateful that your kids are here today. If they come running up to the stage, well, that's okay. Uh, I tried to get a hug from somebody today, and they ran off from me, but I don't expect that to happen. So if you have your Bible this morning, I'd ask you to turn with me to Judges chapter 2, verses 7 through 10. Judges chapter 2, verse 7. And just a few verses and just a few minutes to talk about passing along the faith to the next generation. That's really the theme today. And I'm so glad you're here. I read the story, true story, of a pastor who called, uh, a lady called the church early Sunday morning and said, um, I won't be there today, I am sick. And he said, true story, he said, we had men's breakfast and I had to make a run to Walmart and I ran into this woman at Walmart. And I said, I just talked to you a few minutes ago and you said you were sick. Did you have a quick recovery? And she said, yeah, I had a pretty um, miraculous recovery. I just practiced the faith that you preach. I said, I'm going to go to Walmart and trust I'll get better. He, she said, I came to Walmart, presto. She said, true story. I, she told the pastor, presto, I'm feeling better. He said, well, that is so wonderful. Are you going to come to church now that you're feeling better? She said, you know, I got this miracle at Walmart and I want to see what else I can find here. I want to say thank you for being in church. Thanks for being in worship. Now listen, this is what the Bible says in Judges chapter 2, verse 7. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. And they buried him within the border of his inheritance at timnath Harris, in the mountains of Ephraim, on the north side of Mount Gaosh. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, when they died, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. You know, that may be some of the saddest verses in the Bible, that you had a couple generations that were devoted followers of God. Joshua was a devoted follower, and he experienced all the miracles of God in Egypt. He saw the crossing of the Red Sea. And he passed that story along. He saw the miracle of the manna coming down from God out of heaven. He saw all the great things that God did in the wilderness. And then he also was there when the Jordan River parted and the people crossed over into the land of Canaan. And Joshua was there when the city of Jericho, the walls fell down. Joshua saw some great and awesome works of God. And the Bible says they passed it along to the next generation. And then you have that really sad phrase, there arose a generation who did not know the Lord, nor the works that he had done. I wanted to say when I read that text, may that never be said of San Saba or San Saba's First Baptist Church, that there arose a generation who did not know the Lord, nor the works that he had done. 
So I got to thinking, how are we as a people of God going to make sure that never happens? And let me give you three thoughts, and I'll do it quickly. Number one, I want you to treasure the faith. I want you to treasure your faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 8 says, The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. You may say, well, that's some great miracles that God performed in times past. But what about today? Well, I'm telling you, we believe today without, without apology, God created the world. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we as a church are going to be faithful to pass along to the next generation that it's God who created all things. We're going to pass along to the next generation that the Bible is true and trustworthy. And the miracles that God performed as recorded in the scriptures are true. We're going to pass along that Jesus Christ died on the cross for the sins of the world. That Jesus rose again from the dead. That Jesus is coming again. And that Jesus Christ is the only way by which a person can experience forgiveness of sins and everlasting life in heaven. We're going to be faithful to pass along to the next generation because we treasure this faith that God has given to us through His Word. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 verse 20, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead. When you walk through Mill Pond or when you walk through the nature park or you look out there when you're, when you're hunting deer, all of you deer hunters, and you marvel at the creation of God, it's a testimony of God's power and of God's greatness. And we're going to pass along these truths to the next generation. God is creator and God is savior. The Bible says in John chapter 3 verse 16, let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hey, we are people who believe that Jesus Christ is the only way by which we can be saved. Acts chapter 5 verse 12 says, There is salvation in no other, for there is no other name under heaven among men by which we must be saved, but the name of Jesus. And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Now listen, there's a story in the Bible in Matthew chapter 14. It's called the Pearl of Great Price. It's a story that Jesus told about the kingdom of God. He said a man went out to a field and he found this pearl that was of great value. And he sold everything he had in order to purchase the field so he could have that pearl. That pearl in scripture is the kingdom of God. It's salvation. It's a relationship with Christ. There is nothing more important in this world than to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. To know that your sins have been forgiven. To know that you're a child of God. You've been born again. The Spirit of God lives in you. Listen, the church is not a social club. We're not just a support fellowship. No, we are the redeemed of God. We are the family of God. Our names are written in the book of life. Our bodies are the temple of the Spirit of God. And the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. We are the people of God. I want you to treasure your faith. Why? Because you won't pass along to the next generation something that is of no value to you. If you don't value your faith, you won't pass it along. So I want us as a congregation, as the people of God, to be willing to pass this faith along, to treasure it. In the book of Jude, it says, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. The Good News Bible says fight for the faith. The New Living says defend the faith. The Amplified Bible says fight strenuously for the faith. Hey, we're the generation. It's on us. We have the baton in our hand. 
We got to pass along to the next generation the wonderful works of God. And people before us have sacrificed in order that we might have what we have today. I'm so grateful for the preacher T. Howard. I wish when I get to heaven, maybe I'll meet this guy. We read a little bit about him in 1856. He founded the church out there on Simpson Creek. And we've, we found out he was a, a founder of several different churches. And we appreciate so thankful to God that somebody back before the Civil War had a vision of having a church right here in San Saba that would be a testimony to the faith, a proclamation of the gospel, a place of fellowship and encouragement. And thank God for those generations before us that laid the foundation that today, 165 years later, that the San Saba's First Baptist Church can still give glory to God and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ with a crowd of people who gather. By the way, you get a crowd like this about every 165 years. <laughs> I love the story of William Tyndale. He was strangled and his body was burned at the stake on October the 6th of 1536. The crime for which he was executed is that he translated the Bible into English. If you have an English Bible today, you're in debt to William Tyndale. It was against the law that day and that day and time, but he had a conviction that everybody ought to be able to read the Bible in their own language. So he translated the Bible into English. And in 1536, he was burned at the stake for that crime. People before us have sacrificed and committed and resolved in order that we today can have this foundation of faith, this, this faith in Christ. And somebody passed it along to us. Treasure the faith. And secondly, I want you to live the faith. The Bible says they served the Lord in the days of Joshua and the days after Joshua, but evidently there was a generation that quit serving the Lord. They quit living the faith. Their children discovered that their faith wasn't that authentic outside maybe the synagogue. Can I share with you a story? Not a story, just a, just a statement. You will never... Introduce your children to a God that you do not serve. Our kids are smart. They see through it. Is it just habit? Is it just on the surface? Or does it really mean something to us? Is the Bible important to us? Do we really pray? Or do we really worship? Do they see the authenticity, the genuineness of your faith? Not just when you come and gather in worship, but at home when you're with the family. We pass along the faith when the faith is real to us. I want you to treasure the faith. I want you to live the faith. I think of the men that when I came to this church, men who've died now, gone on to be with the Lord, who were such a blessing to my life that they lived out this faith. I think about Craig and Johnson. I remember him telling his testimony to me as he worked at the tractor store, sharing about his faith in Christ. I remember Keith Robertson, the interim pastor who served here before I came as pastor, and how he encouraged me and took me under wing and prayed for me. But I remember the genuineness of his faith. Men like Desmond Doyle and Matt Kaysen and Lewis Crump and Larry Scheibner and Archie Rutherford, who nearly killed me when he took me to Algeria to, to see my old home place. He was driving the pickup. I really knew when Archie started driving that I needed to be driving and not him. We crossed 190 and he just gunned it. Didn't look either way. Just gunned it. I saw my life flash before my eyes. Men like Malden Norris and Bill Kirkpatrick and men like Charlie Martin. Folks who serve the Lord and were influenced in my life. And I want us to live the faith. The National Study of Youth and Religion shows that if that children will retain their faith as adults, if the parents model genuine faith in Jesus, those are the stats. There's a book written entitled Handing Down the Faith, and this is what Lifeway Research says. The more important religion is to parents, and the more parents attend religious services, the more important religion becomes to their children. And the more their children attend religious services, even years 
after they no longer live with their parents. Hey, you want to pass along the faith? Live the faith. You want your children to walk with God? You walk with God. You want your kids to understand the power of prayer? You pray. You want your kids to worship, not just in the congregation, then you worship. We, we pass this along, and people have passed it along to us because of the genuineness, the authenticity of their faith. I remember a professor in seminary telling the story when he was a pastor of someone dropping off children at the door, dropping off children at the door. And he said, I could tell that this father was headed to the golf course. He had his golf shirt on. He had golf clubs in the back seat. He was driving up to drop his son off. And he said, I overheard the argument between the two. And the son says, but dad, I don't want to go to church. And the father said, you're going to go to church because when I was a kid, I had to go to church. The son got out of the car, slammed the door, and he said through the window, okay, then I'll go, but I bet it doesn't do me any more good than it did you. You will never introduce your child to a God you do not know, to a God you do not serve. These men in Joshua's day, what a, what a wonderful statement that as long as Joshua was alive and the elders behind him lived, that they served the Lord. But then that sad comment, there arose a generation that did not know the Lord nor the works that God had done. God help us in this church. We resolve boldly, unashamedly, persistently to continually impress on the next generation the wonder of God, the creation of God, and the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. His death on the cross, His resurrection from the grave. I want us to treasure the faith. I want us to live the faith. And thirdly, I want us to share the faith. Deliberately, intentionally tell your children your faith in Jesus Christ. I don't want anybody here to die and their children bury them wondering what they believed. And that's happened to me upon occasion. I'll bury somebody and I'll ask their kids, so what did your dad believe? And we'll stand at the grave and we'll kind of look at each other and he'll say, you know, I really don't know. What a sad commentary that children are left to wonder what their parents believed. No wonder there arose a generation who did not know the Lord or the works of the Lord because the faith in Christ wasn't important enough. This is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I received. Wow! God has a plan for passing along the faith from generation to generation. It's, it's, it's called sharing. It's called talking. It's called telling my testimony, witnessing to my children. My kids have no doubt who I serve and what I believe. And this is what Paul said. This is what I received. That Christ died on the cross for our sins, according to the Scriptures. And He was buried. And He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Hey, this is why we have this new children's sanctuary dedicated to the Lord and that new building dedicated to the Lord. We have a place where the church can gather the children and tell them the wonderful works of God. Now listen, that's a family responsibility first, but the church comes along beside to encourage children in their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we want to share the faith. Psalms 145 verse 4 says, One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 14 says, But you must continue in the things you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood. Let's read that together. And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. You know, the Bible says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? There is nothing in this world more valuable than the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
than the salvation of the soul, the forgiveness of sin, the assurance of heaven. Treasure the faith and live the faith and share the faith. And the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, this is God's command to the children of Israel. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. I was researching this word impress. The New American Standard says, teach them diligently. The Amplified Bible says impress God's precepts on their minds and penetrate their hearts with this truth. The Contemporary English Bible says, tell them to your children over and over again. It happened, I happened upon the Tyndale translation. Tyndale's the guy they burned at the stake for translating the Bible into English. This is what Tyndale writes in his translation in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Wet them on thy children. Wet them on thy children. I was telling one of our deacons, it says, wet them on thy children. He said, what does that mean, wash them? No, it's the word wet, W-H-E-T. And I got to thinking, that's what my father-in-law, he had a whetstone. A lot of times in the evening, especially during deer season, he'd take his whetstone. And he'd sharpen his knife. It always worried me just a little bit when he did this in my presence before we got married. <laughs> One day he actually said, come here, Sam, let me see if this blade is sharp. <laughs> I said, what do you want me to do? He said, roll up your sleeve. I'm thinking, I don't, I don't know if this is a good idea, bub. <laughs> to wet is to sharpen. To wet is to continually go over and over and over till you have a blade that's sharp that can be used. And Tyndale's translation says, like you sharpen a knife, I want you to tell your children the Word of God. I want you to memorize it. I want you to impress it on them. I want you to tell the stories. I want you to live the faith. I want you to treasure the faith. I want you to congregate with God's people and worship together. I want your kids to be sharp in the Lord and in their knowledge of the Lord. Jesus Christ over and over and over until you've got a blade that's usable. Wet them on your children. Let me tell you something. Buildings do not pass along the faith. This building won't pass along the faith to anybody. And that building we remodeled won't pass along the faith. We can dedicate the building. We can dedicate this sanctuary. Praise God for 15 years. We've enjoyed this brand new sanctuary. Praise the Lord. It's been wonderful. Buildings don't pass along the faith. Buildings don't preserve the faith. This certainly is a testimony to the community of how important our faith is to us. But listen, in the final analysis, what passes along the faith it's people. It's parents. It's grandparents. If there's a generation who rises and does not know the Lord, it won't be this building's fault. We want to dedicate ourselves. We dedicate ourselves, Lord. Until the Lord Jesus comes, I will treasure this faith. I will live this faith. I will share this faith so the generation to come knows the wonderful works of God. Unashamed, unapologetically, I will live for and share this faith. Until Jesus comes. Until Jesus comes. Let's pray together. 
Heavenly Father, we are grateful. Grateful that sometime, somewhere in the past, somebody shared with us faith in Jesus Christ. Might have been a Sunday school teacher, or a church member, or a wanna leader, or a deacon, or just a parent, a grandparent, somebody sometime in our past shared the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ with us. And today, Lord, we're saved partially because of the witness of somebody in our life who made sure that we knew the, the great works of God. And Lord, as we celebrate 165 years and we're so grateful for the past generations who have faithfully served you and loved you and persevered through difficulty, Father, as we stand today as this new congregation, as the witness to our current culture, as the stewards of our children, we dedicate ourselves to you. We want, Lord, for this church to continue to pass along the faith to the next generation. For the, for the stories of the Word of God, for especially the message of salvation, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, we want our kids and our grandkids, we want this generation, Lord, to grow up knowing the truth of the Lord Jesus. And Father, if this church exists another 165 years, there'll be a generation then that'll stand and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's the only way to heaven. He's the only way of forgiveness of sin. And so, God, today we want to dedicate the buildings, but mostly ourselves, to you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I wondered to myself, how do we close a service like this? And this is how we're going to do it. I think there's at least two things on our hearts. Some here today just want to come pray. You want to dedicate your family. You want to dedicate your children. You want to dedicate your marriage. You want to dedicate your home. You, you understand it. For, for, as for me and my house, like Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. As we sing this next song, I just ask you to come and kneel on this altar. I can't think of a an expression of honor to the Lord that's greater than just kneeling before the Lord. Dedicating yourself to God. But you know what? You really can't dedicate yourself to the Lord if you've never been saved. You're here today, you'd say, you know, I've, I've never trusted Christ. I don't know what it means for my sins to be forgiven. I, I have no confidence that I'm going to heaven. But I want to. What a great day to give your life to Jesus Christ. You'd say, well, will Jesus take me? Well, the Bible says, whoever comes to the Father, he'll by no means turn them away. This could be your day to call upon the Lord, and he'll save you. So we're going to dedicate our lives and our families as we come forward. There's going to be some Sunday school teachers and spouses and some deacons who, and spouses come and stand here at the front when this invitation song starts. And you may want to, one of them to pray with you. And then you simply may just want to get at this altar. Father, I'm dedicating my life for your glory and for this next generation till I die or till Jesus comes. I set myself apart for you. That's what Jesus said in John 17. I sanctify myself for their sakes. Let's stand together as we sing this song. And as we sing, this is your moment to come and just simply kneel before the Lord or give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. As we sing together, you step out and come.
seated. Michelle, you have some instructions for us for lunch. I heard tummies rumbling during the sermon. So you come tell us. Good morning. We are so glad that you joined us for worship this morning. And we are ready for lunch. Um, we want to thank our hospitality team 
they're not in here, of course. They've been setting up all morning, but we are so appreciative of them. So thank you, hospitality team. Okay, so we're going to have um, we're going to have it set up a little bit differently this morning. We have two lines that we'll need to split and enter in the two doors that go into Mark's Sunday School classroom right across from the youth room. You'll slip into the two doors there, and then when you get into the fellowship hall, there'll be two rows of tables. You can go down either side. We're thinking we're going to get folks through pretty quickly this morning. And then you can exit out um, the doors and to the tent. Now, if you are going to <coughs> with a small child and you need containment, there are tables and chairs set up in the youth room as well. You're more than welcome to join me and Brantley down there. We will see you there. <coughs> Excuse me. If you have not picked up a um, 106th anniversary Christmas ornament, please do so. They're in this basket right out here in the foyer. They'll enjoy lunch. Huh? One per family. Yeah. Also, there's the silent auction. You may not know what that is, but there's, our ladies in the church have baked desserts, and they're all scattered around all the way in. So as, you, as you're moving toward the, the lunch line, you're going to be packing all these desserts. All the money that's taken up for the silent auction is used to finance um, our Operation Christmas Child. It costs $8 a box to send those boxes. We have about a 1000 something like that, that we'll have to raise. So that's where the money's going for the silent auction. So you can just write something down and, and, uh, and bid on one of those, and that money will go to help the postage for Operation Christmas Child. So we're excited about that. Um, so anyway, I think you've known everything. Let's stand together. We're going to grab a hand of somebody next to us as we close our service in song. And uh, before we do that, just stay right where you are. Mark's going to pray over the meal. And then we're going to sing I'll Fly Away. And we'll be dismissed to go to eat. God bless you. Thank you for being in the house of God this morning. If you're glad to be here again, say amen. 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 Let us pray. Father God, we thank you today for this time. Lord, I thank you for each, each person represented here today. I, I, I pray that you open our hearts. Continue to open our hearts. Open our minds to your word. Let us, let us be your standard in the world. Father, we pray now for this food we are about to partake. And we pray these in Jesus' name. Amen. So glad I'm born.